Greetings, everyone, and praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Stand to your feet if you're here in the live sanctuary and give God a round of applause for he is good and his mercy endures forever. While you're standing on your feet, Father, thank you so much for this evening. Before we ask you for anything, we thank you for everything, Lord. This has been a, a long day, a long month, a long year already, God, but you are with us and your mercy endures forever, Lord. Forgive us for all of our sins, any and all of our iniquities, our shortcomings, procrastinations, our mismanagements, Lord. Anything we could have done to offend our brother, our sister, or even those who are even enemies of the cross. Forgive us, Lord God, for not being a witness enough. I'm asking tonight, Lord, that you would bless all of those that are watching tonight, uh, that are here live in the sanctuary, and even those that are watching, Lord God, by way of social media, or any of their devices, Father God. Bless our pastor, Dr. Mormon and Sister Mormon, Lord, that they would find rest in this season, God, and that you will bless Christian Tabernacle Church, Lord, to do and to continue to do the work, Lord God, to spread across this dying and dark generation. We come against every lie and every suggestion of the devil. Our miracle is still on schedule, and we thank you for all of that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, and thank God. Amen. You can be seated in their presence. Of the Lord. God bless you all. Today is, and it happens to be the 5th of July, 2022, the year of our Lord. We give God glory for our pastor, Dr. James Mormon, who's been celebrating, amen, his pastoral anniversary. He and Sister Mormon, we salute you and we thank God for you. We thank God for all of our ministers, our leaders. We thank God Dr. Cecil Forbes taught us last month and talked about peer pressures. And we thank God for you, Dr. Forbes. Bless you to Pastor Fier, C2 Ministry, to all of our graphics, our ministry, uh, those who are operating. We just want to say praise the Lord. I uh, want to give God glory tonight for uh, God blessing my rib cage to be a little irritated about this time last year. And I uh, thank God for those uh, who have not met my wife. I want to thank God for my wife, Kanita, tonight, who is here with us tonight in the sanctuary. God bless you, beautiful lady. Amen. Let us go into the word of God tonight. First of all, I wanted to give everybody a preface this month. Uh, and this is the summer months that are these months, excuse me, that are here now are the summer months. And uh, we thank God for Evangelist Fuggs, who's going to be sharing uh, the word of God with us and just wanted to first before we dive into Bible study just discuss that the this is the seventh month of the year and the number seven represents completion or fullness <laughs> amen and so just to preface you before we move forward amen in our Bible discussion that we're expecting God I don't know about you all but I'm expecting God in my personal life in my life of marriage in my life of ministry life as a father, amen, and just uh, as a citizen of this country, I'm expecting God for the completion, amen, to take place. Does anybody want to agree with me tonight? Amen. Actually, I'm going to take the step, amen, to agree with you in your completion. And so before we go forth, everything that we discuss this month will be in regards to completion. We have different topics um, each week, um, but I want you all to focus in on completion. And if you understand the word completion, uh, before we dive into the word tonight, um, remember that, that God created the heavens, the earth, the fowl of the air, the beasts of the field, the great waters, the depths of the waters, all from nothing in six days. The Bible says that on the seventh day, he did what? <laughs> completion requires rest. I don't know about you all tonight, but I believe that not only does God, does God want us practically to get good sleep, but to find rest. Sleep is what might you, you might want, but rest is what your body needs. And so we're praying for rest, not only mentally, but spiritually rest finding completion and rest in your financial life. Hallelujah. In my financial life, I'll, I'll, I'll agree, praise the Lord, with myself on that one. And I'll agree with you that we're looking for rest in our finances, Brother Brock. And we're looking for rest in our minds and rest in our goals and the things that we want to achieve in life. We want to find rest in who we are as Christians and to better ourselves in that place. But sometimes we just need 
to rest. All right, let's go to the book of Luke real quick. Tonight we're going to talk about our topic is the life of a witness. The life of a witness. Our key passage for tonight will be found in the book of Luke, chapter number 14. Amen. Good to see everybody tonight. Hopefully you all have had a good day. It might have been long, might be tired, but you're healthy tired. Amen. (laughs) Amen. Let's go to Luke chapter 14, verse 23. These guys are going to put on the screen. I'm going to read the NIV version tonight. And um, we're going to focus tonight again on the life of a witness. So that my house will be full. Go to verse 24. Matter of fact, do me a favor, guys. If you don't mind, can you, if it's all possible, I don't want to trouble you too much, go to, go back to verse, let's start from verse 21, if you don't mind, just so we can set the tone. Thank you so much for your patience. (laughs) Start at verse 21. If you got it, say, I got the word. word. Only two of y'all got the word, say, I got the word. word. Only three of y'all say, I got the word. word. (laughs) Okay. If it's all possible, thank you. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, oh, this is good, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there is still room for more. So his master said, go into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge everybody shout, anyone. Anyone. Say it again, Anyone. anyone. Anyone you find to come so that the house will be Fool. Man, for none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. Let's, let's just stop right there. That's a mouthful, y'all. The life of a witness is, is, is very interesting. Does anybody remember the first time that you had fellowship with God? And you didn't care what people thought. You didn't care what your old friends, what they, what, they, what they made of you when you decided to live for Christ. Remember you said, I'm going to stop drinking, man. I'm going to stop smoking. I'm going to stop womanizing, right? I'm going to stop gambling, man. I'm going to stop thinking certain ways, and I want to elevate the way I think in life. That required me making a decision to live now for Christ. So when you made that decision, do you remember that feeling? It didn't matter what anybody thought. It didn't matter about anybody's opinion of you. It went from someone to anyone. So the life of a witness is not a closed-minded life. The life of a witness is not just my foe and no more. The life of a witness is not just black people. Oh, oh, my bad. I didn't mean to go there, y'all. The, the life of a witness is not just white people. The life of a witness is not just Southfield, Michigan. The life of a witness is worldwide. Is there anyone I can reach today, Lord? So the life of a witness, we, 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 we've got to reconfigure how we see the life of that we live as witnesses. And so the reason why we're focusing on this is because he said, this time, go. And the King James Version said to the, to the highways and byways, to the hedges, right? And it doesn't say argue with them. <laughs> it, it doesn't say make them. It says go and compel them to come that my house, hallelujah, may be filled. 
Now, some people might have a problem with this scripture because they will look at this and say, oh, wait a minute. They, they, would, they would think a little small. Let's, 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 let's rewire ourselves and think about this. Because most times Christians are ministering to other Christians. <laughs> we really want to share our revelation with those who already have the revelation. So now we become a little club, so to speak. We become a sorority or fraternity. When he said go to the highways and the byways and to the hedges, the NIV version says, and invite them to the banquet, those who weren't invited to the banquet. Can I ask you a rhetorical question? Who have you invited lately? Are we counting on Dr. James L. Mormon to do all the work for us? Are we counting on Sister Mormon? Are we counting on Dr. Cecil Forbell? Oh, he, he's going to teach tonight. Let him, let him do all the work. Or are we going out to be a witness? Now, here's what's amazing about the word witness. There's, there's so many connotations because it, it, according to the word of God, you, out of the mouth of two or three the, 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 of witnesses that his word, your word is, is, is established. Yeah. Now, most people take that scripture and they, they, they misinterpret it. Because in that connotation, I don't have time to talk about it tonight. It says that if I have a, a problem with you, that I'm to bring you before a witness. Now, if that witness does not hear me, then I'll take you before the priest. If you don't hear me in front of the priest, now I can bring you in front of the congregation. But it doesn't make sense for me to feel like I'm anointed if I've blown my witness. And most people feel like they can get up and they feel like ministry is me standing in front of you and teaching you. When ministry is at work. Ministry is how do you look yeah. on social media. Yeah. Ministry is how do you act in the break room. Yeah. So he says, go. Let me tell you something. The life of a witness, we are not people that just sit down and wait for anything to happen. We're go-getters. Man, if I'm, if I'm out somewhere just getting some lunch, I'm just, I'm just looking for an opportunity prayerfully. <laughs> Prayerfully, because, you know, some people won't hear you. And that's okay, too. But you, I'm prayerfully always in the mindset of, Lord, who can I invite today to the kingdom? It could be a Monday afternoon at a barbecue on the 4th of July. It could be at the grocery store, and I ran into someone who couldn't afford groceries. Can I use that moment? Can I use that opportunity as a witness? Oh, man, let me hit home. Y'all, we living in a crazy generation where we need some more witnesses. Anytime you can walk into a classroom with children and take lives, somebody lost a witness. Anytime you can kill people who are not armed, somebody's blown the witness. That's why I love the courtroom, because justice has to be served when it is served. Because you always have to have a witness. Yeah. Somebody's got evidence on what you believe. Yeah. Somebody got evidence. Everybody's not going the wrong way. Everybody's not thinking this thing the same way. Somebody during the pandemic said, God, we need you. We need to hear from you. We need a word from you. Yeah. It can't just be church as usual anymore. It can't just be coming in because you gave a big tithe and because you're sitting on the front row or in the back row or on the side row that you think you got dibs on God. This is an everyday lifestyle. I know you get tired. I know you get weary. I know you get frustrated. I know sometimes your back is up against the wall. You're backing up 10 times. You're moving forward one time, but keep your witness. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go off. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Stop, don't, and don't, don't sell. Don't deviate from being a witness. So Luke, the writer, tells us <laughs> that we are commissioned to go. Everybody shout go. Now, tonight at 7.30, we're talking about it. But tomorrow 
at 730, something needs to have happened from tonight. There should be at least one more witness by this time tomorrow. Amen. Can we do it? Shall we do it? We're going to do this. Okay. Let's give you some principles in regards to our witness. There's so many scriptures that have the word witness, witnesses, to be a witness. But tonight, we're just going to narrow it down to a few things. And I would encourage you as Bible students, as lovers of God, as Christians, as Bible believers, in your spare time, look up the word witness. I'm going to say this before we go to the principles. The reason why we had to go there is because most times, if I can bring this home, most times we feel like our witness requires miles. Sometimes the greatest witness is in your same bedroom. Sometimes your, great, your greatest witness is in the next cube next to you working on Wednesday afternoon. Sometimes you don't know it, but your witness can be right next to you in the pews. So the first principle about being a witness, principle number one, before you stand up, you must stand out. I wish we had time to deal with it, but let's go real quick to Jonah chapter number one. And you all know the story of Jonah already, so I'm not, I'm not going to read it in its, in, in its entirety, but I do want to present it to you. Before you stand up, you must stand out. Because many people are wearing Jesus' last name. Oh, I'm a Christian. But there are certain things that you're into, it does not represent or represent Christ. So Jonah, chapter number one, we'll start at verse number three. We're going to skip through. If you got to say, I got the word. word. All right, Jonah chapter number one, we'll start at verse number three. It says, but Jonah ran away from (laughs) from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. (laughs) After paying the fare, people will pay to run from God. He went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from God or from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. Somebody say, "Uh uh-oh. And such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. It's going to get good, y'all. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. (laughs) But Jonah had gone below the deck, oh gosh, watch this, y'all, where he laid down and fell into a deep, the Bible says, sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Notice what he said, yo God, right? Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. We're talking about his witness. They cast lots and the lot fell on who? They blamed Jonah. Because they are praying to all their gods, right? Mm, Nothing's happening. Okay, so they ask him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Matter of fact, what's your occupation, brother? Where do you come from? Where are you from? What hood are you from, bro? What is your country? Where are you from, dude? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This is awesome. This terrified them, and they asked. <laughs> now, now, keep in mind right there. Put a pause on it, y'all. Keep in mind, the very God that he worships is the God that's troubling the land right now. Because remember, they all began to worship their own God. 
please keep in mind that when people say God, we ain't talking about the same God all the time. No offense, no harm, no punt intended. But when people say, oh, we, we, we doing the same thing, we're not doing the same thing. We're we not serving the same God. So watch this, verse 10. This terrified them, and they ask, what have you done? Matter of fact, they ask, what's your occupation? Where you're from? What's your ethnicity? Where's your country? Now they say, what did you do? They knew he was running away from the Lord. They knew, talking about his witness, because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied. <laughs> this is strong. We're almost there, y'all. And it will become calm. I know that this, excuse me, that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. We're talking about a witness. Instead, the men did their best to throw, to, excuse me, to row back to land. But they couldn't. For the sea grew even, somebody say, wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Skip this. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Make a long story short, y'all already know the story. They threw him overboard. And of course, at the end of the chapter, it says that there was a whale or a big fish was waiting for him to swallow him. The first principle is before you stand up, you must stand out. Your witness should include a different language. Your witness should include a different look. Your witness should include a different attitude, a different spirit in such a way that when you mess up, other people know your God. <laughs> Lord, help us today. That if you go astray, if you drift a little bit, people will know, man, your God is the same God that's causing us problems because of your disobedience. So before you stand up for something, make sure you first stand out. It's very important that as Christians, as believers, as a witness, that we are different, that we are set aside, that we, the Bible says, are a holy and a peculiar nation. It doesn't mean you're better than, it just means you're better off. <laughs> doesn't mean you're better than anyone, you're just better off. Your, your witness should be, and your lifestyle should be so loud, my dad used to always say, your life should be louder than your mouth. Your life should be so loud, it irritates people to God. <laughs> Why are you always praying over your food when it's lunchtime? Man, just go ahead and bite the sandwich. <laughs> right? Why are you always coming to the tab when the doors are open and, and running down and shouting and praising the Lord and giving your tithes to that place? What, what is that all about? You know, now we got people who got a problem with the word. talking about our witness and all the witness represents is what do you represent what do you believe God for what do you believe in why do you believe this so before you stand up make sure you stand out let's go to our second principle principle number two our witness includes the testimony of Jesus. Let's go to St. John chapter number four, y'all, real quick, real quick. Our testimony of Jesus is included in our witness. So principle number two is our witness includes the testimony of Jesus. St. John chapter number four, if you got to say, I got the word. Doing a little reading tonight, y'all. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. 
Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. This is Bible study, amen? amen? So he left Judea and went back once more, where? To Galilee. Follow us tonight, saints. Now, he had to go through Samaria. Somebody say he had to. That's a very important passage there. He had to. There are some things in your life you're wondering, why am I going here? Why did I meet this person? Why am I in this place? You have to. It's not a choice. It's a decision. Thank you so much, group. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. This is so good. Jacob's well was there, yes, and Jesus, tired. He was tired, but he still had a witness in himself. As he was from the journey, sat down by the well, it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her. Notice, he didn't wait for her to speak to him. Even though she's a Samaritan woman, we'll go there in a minute. But Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, are you a Jew? I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for drink? Conversations getting irritated now based upon, uh, uh, based upon geography, so to speak. But watch this. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you <laughs> living water. Oh, hallelujah. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank, it, drank from it himself? As did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water, hallelujah, I give them will never thirst indeed. The water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. Paul's right there, y'all. This, this gets really, really deep. But we're talking about the life of a witness. Remember, principle number two is our witness always includes the testimony of Jesus. The beautiful thing I love about John, this is Bible study. The book of John always reveals Jesus. Always. Anytime you hear somebody say, let's go to the book of John, always expect to hear some illustration, some parable, or some action that Jesus took to always, oh my God, I love you, Lord, to always demonstrate the work of God through Jesus. So the book of John always illustrates anything concerning Jesus through God. Anytime someone says the book of John, you, your, your antenna should go up. I'm about to read something that Jesus said or something that Jesus did to demonstrate his power. Amen? So what Jesus did is, of course, against the customs, he's sitting down at this well. Now remember, he's thirsty. He's hungry. He just did, he just took a journey. His disciples have left. They went to go buy food. We're going to take care of Jesus, come back. Long story short, they came back and saw this man talking to a Samaritan woman. What? Jesus, you tripping. Right? And you all know the story already, but I would encourage you to continue to read and study this scripture because Jesus says to this woman, where we left off is, go call your husband and come back. First of all, in their customs of time, Jesus had no business, according to their customs, according to this time, talking, first of all, to a Samaritan, let alone a woman. <laughs> yeah, right. 
And so Jesus now, what he says, and I'm paraphrasing, but of course, I encourage you to go back and read it. He said, go call your husband, come back. Talking about witnessing, right? She said, I don't have a husband. He says, you've spoken the truth. You don't have a husband. Matter of fact, the one that you're sleeping with right now is not yours either. Oh, you nosy, Jesus. You all up in my grits. How do you know this? See, remember, he laid the foundation by saying, if you would understand the gift of God and who it is that's asking you of this water, you won't be thirsty again. But why are you thirsty for love with a man? Why are you thirsty of love with another man? It's because you haven't drank in this water. So the form of witnessing that Jesus used is life principles. <laughs> and sometimes when you talk to people, you got to get on a level. You got to talk, they talk. I, don't, I didn't say do what they do. Let me go on the other side of the podium. I said, you got to talk, they talk. Not do, they do. There's a difference, y'all, because so, somebody out there, oh, I can wear this now. I can let my hair down now. I can go out and I can. No, don't do that. <laughs> so I can sell drugs to win a drug dealer? Oh, bro. No. See, some of us, we go to the extreme unreasonably. I didn't say do what they do, y'all. I'm saying you got to talk, they talk. How do you witness? You open your mouth. You just begin a conversation. But include Jesus. Don't include your opinion. Don't include your thoughts. Don't include your ideas. Don't include how the church hurt you and somebody mistreated me. Don't include that. Just include the testimony of Jesus. How did he save your life? How did he change your heart? Don't you remember? Because that decision is so important and we, we get so casual with that. That's one of my favorite parts of the service, Brother Ray, is altar call. I love praise and worship. Y'all, they be up here killing y'all. They be up here jamming. I love it. I love the word. I love it. But man, there's just something special. It reminds me and it almost brings me to tears now thinking the day I made a decision. The day I, I, I made my witness and my election sure. I want to serve Christ, man. If it costs my life, I'm serving him. Till the day I die, till I roll up out of here, man, I'm serving Jesus, y'all. And y'all can do what y'all want to do. As, see, 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 the thing is, they, they, we, 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 we're so emotional that we're not spiritual enough. And I have to argue with you. I have to argue with you. Because some people say, oh, you're so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good. Okay, I understand where you're trying to go with that. I'll give you maybe two inches of that. But the Bible says to walk in the spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let me tell y'all, because we saved don't mean we forgot how to sin. Let's, let's just cut that cake right now. Some folk feel like, Sister, Sister uh, Woods, that because you are forgiven and you're so loving and you're on the pastoral care team, you forgot how to cut somebody out. <laughs> they walk right past you, they ain't say nothing to you. Hey, Pastor, how y'all doing? You looking like this, she just... Y'all know that crazy look? <laughs> that, that look that turned your whole body? <laughs> the crazy one? They, 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 they think because we saved Dr. Forbes, we didn't forgot how to get somebody straight. You didn't cut me off at the light and I had to ride away too? Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. See, don't, don't act strange on me now. Or you know how you're in the grocery line and, some, and, and it's like lines that ain't even organized and somebody just decides, oh, yeah, I'm next. You've been standing here for five minutes with three logs, two diapers, five baskets. They, we ain't forgot, Brother Lawrence, how to sin. But what we learn how to do is control the sin nature. Amen? That creates the greatest witness is when you got power to say no to the devil and yes to God. 
Yeah. You, you want to be labeled as a champion? Control what's trying to control you. Amen. You want to be a great witness? Lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily beset us. Because you put that battle down for 15 years don't mean year 16, the taste going to come back. Or it's not going to come back. But it takes power. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I got power. So our witness always includes the testimony of Jesus. Principle number three. Our life is a written epistle. Let's go to 2 Corinthians real quick, chapter number three. And it says, we are beginning to commend ourselves again or do we need like some people letters of recommendation to you from you <laughs> you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts known and read by who come on say it with me everyone there you go you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent, and ourselves to claim anything for ourselves but our competence comes from who God he has made us competent as ministers everybody shout ministers the root word of ministers is servant of a new covenant not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter kills but the spirit gives life again principle three is our life is a written letter it's an epistle. An epistle. And that's why you see, and this is Bible study, in the back of your Bible, if you go there, if you see Timothy, if you see John, if you, when you see uh, these different scriptures, it says the epistle of Paul. He was writing letters. A letter is a specific letter to specific people. <laughs> Specifically, God wants you to reach everybody. Specifically, God wants you to reach everybody. Some people, when they hear that, specifically, oh, what group, what culture, what nation? Everyone. So your life is a letter. What did you write today in your life? What was written? What was transcribed in your heart today? Your life is a written letter. We're almost there, y'all. Principle number four. Principle number four, simply... There is no witness without evidence. Go to Acts chapter 5 real quick. We're just moving quick. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. <laughs> Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right and, his, and as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. Praise God for that. We are witnesses of these things, so, and so is the Holy Spirit. Somebody shout Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Whom God has given to those who what? obey him when they heard this they were furious and wanted to put them to death but a Pharisee named Gamiel the teacher of the law who was honored by all the people stood up in the Sahedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while <laughs> then he addressed the Sanhedrin Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. <laughs> these guys are anointed. Watch this, y'all. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. 
he was killed and all his followers were dispersed and it all came to nothing after him Judas was a Galilean a period of the days of census and led a band of people in revolt he too was killed and all his followers were scattered therefore in the present case I advise you leave these men alone let them go for if their purpose is or if their perfect pur purpose excuse me or activity is of human origin it will fail but I love this if it is from God you hallelujah will not be able to stop these men you will only find yourselves fighting against God when people fight you it's not you it's God so again there is no witness without evidence you my brother you my sister you my friend are the evidence that witnessing works Amen. you are the evidence that witnessing works Amen. I'll tell you why because someone witnessed to you you didn't get here by yourself Amen. Amen. in your little 40 50 years of life I think it's safe to say I think it's a wonderful suggestion to say that you've had some help Witnessing is a tool for help. It helps people to remember to know God. It helps them to realize, for those that don't believe in God, that there is a God. So there is no witness without evidence. We're almost done, y'all. Principle number five. I'm just going to read these next principles, and I'm going to encourage you for the sake of time to just read them. Amen? Amen. Principle five says our representation requires constant re-presentation or representation. Don't be fooled by the words, y'all. Sometimes I make up stuff too. <laughs> In your spare time, I would encourage you to read Isaiah 43, 10 through 12. Our representation always requires constant representation. Your witness is what you represent. Principle number six. If someone is asking, well, who can be a witness? All believers can be a witness. All believers. My dad used to tell me the weakest Christian is always stronger than the strongest devil. All believers can be a witness. You can read Acts chapter 2, verse 32 in your spare time. Let me give you five witnessing tools. Tool number one as a witness, our church and our ministry. Our church and our ministry is a witness. Number two, outreach, being a part of outreach. Any form of outreach, whether it's jail ministry, whether it's, whether it's going to the hospitals and the nursing homes, whether it's adopting a family, any form of outreach is considered a witness tool. Missions, my wife knows all about that, y'all. She loves this stuff. <laughs> and it's always encouraging others to get out here and to witness to a dying world, not neighborhood, not club or, or, or certain individuals, but to a dying world online and social media even in your daily tasks that's a witnessing tool can i can i tell you all a secret c tab can i tell you a secret those that are watching by way of youtube or facebook everybody should be busy for god i already knew two people was gonna clap on that anyway but most people feel like because you went to church and you saw a minister or you were watching TV and you saw a minister that 
Oh, that's enough. When we come to church, if it's just limited, if it's just limited, just walk with me for a second. Because when we come to church, we need to be filled. Amen? When we come to church, we need energy. Right, Ty? We need, we, sometimes we serve him, but we need, we, need, we need to be strengthened. Amen? So I understand that. What I'm saying is, is when you leave and after you gain your strength, the Bible says, now that you've been converted, go and strengthen your brother. And if, 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 if salvation is only limited to us just coming in and getting a feeling until we come back and we empty again to get another feeling, then we got some homework to do. We got some spiritual homework. And that's okay. This is not a, a word to go off on you or a word to, 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 to cop, chop you down. This is a word to mature us as Christians. We, we got to mature. We got we to gotta stop coming to church and being offended all the time. Because here's another witness. When you go to a wedding, have you noticed they'll stop that wedding and say, is there any just cause while these two shall not be joined together? Please speak now or forever hereafter. Hold your peace. And most of us, we sit there. (laughs) Don't nobody move. Right, Ray? You know what I mean, Sister Beard? And they say that, and Brother brother Chance, what they'll do is they'll hold their breath. <gasps> so nobody says nothing. And then five years later, when there's trouble in their marriage, nobody still says anything. See, if you're a witness at the wedding, you should be a witness to keep them together. Can I be transparent? This is Bible study. This is not Sunday morning. Can I just be real for a minute and then we going home, all right? I'm the kind of friend, y'all, and I want to encourage us to be, especially the brothers. The brothers, let me get a rah-rah real quick. Come on, rah, rah, rah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sisters, it's okay. We, we got some for y'all in a minute, okay? It's okay. Don't be mad at the brothers. But only because as a, as a man, and not just as a man of God, not just as a minister, not just as a preacher, but just as a friend, I truly believe that if a friend is in trouble and they call me and say, man, Ryan, you know, my wife and I, we kind of going through prayerfully. I don't believe in just budging in, but what I'll do is say, man, I was at the wedding and I was a witness. You got to tough this one out. We talking about divorce, man. And you know, man, it's just getting tough and I'm tired of this, man. I, I can't do this no more. You hang in there. Don't blow your witness. Don't blow your cover. If, 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 even if I got to go pick you up and we go off for a little coffee, man, or something and just, hey, man, just, just air it out. But you got to go back into the fight because you don't want to blow your witness. We stood there and didn't say anything. In a courtroom, when you witness, if you're an eyewitness to a crime, they ask for them against how they feel, against their comfort, did you see this take place? Some cases they say, can you identify who did this? That's uncomfortable. Can I tell y'all something? As a witness for Christ, it's not going to always be comfortable. Sometimes you got to go and say, yeah, that, that, that was pornography I dealt with. Yeah, I told that lie right there. Yeah, I, I identify. I'm a witness. Yeah, I, I, I cheated my way through that, man. And, you know, I'm not comfortable with that. Sometimes as a, as a Christian, you got to be a true witness to what God is doing in your life for the sake of others. So it's very important for us to understand this principle because... Our witness always includes other people. So it always, again, principle, uh, well, with those principles that we read tonight, especially the last one, everybody can be a witness. And because you are a believer, it includes everybody. So we talked about all of our witnessing tools. Here are just a few more, three more scriptures and we're going home tonight. If you wanted to learn more about witnessing, read Jeremiah 32 and 44. We're going home. Thank you for your patience tonight. Read Jeremiah 32, verse 44. Also read Luke chapter number 24, verse 48. Again, Luke 24, 48. Read this with your children. It's summertime. Read this with your husband. Read it with your wife. And let's be better witnesses. Last scripture. Hebrews chapter number 12, verse 1. That's a very good one. Again, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. We pray that you were blessed tonight and you learned something about being a witness. 
if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ in the person of your sin, you can make no uh, note of that now. We want to invite you to come. If you are already saved and you know God, give God a round of applause, you guys, tonight for the word. At this time, it is time to give. Hallelujah. Amen. We have different ways that you can give. Uh, if you are like me and you are tax savvy and you love using your phone in this generation, you can always cash up CTAP Church. You can text give to 989-282-7136. Again, text give to 989-282-7136. You can also use the bins in the back of the church where the greeters will greet you. Amen. And you want to continue to stay healthy, everyone. Uh, keeping your masks up as much as possible is hard when we want to fellowship and love on each other, but uh, continue to be healthy and safe. Father, we thank you so much for your anointing. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love that never fails us. Tonight, we have studied and we've talked about, we've seen illustration, we've seen demonstration on the life of a witness. Everything that we read tonight, God, I'm asking that the words of the pages would jump out into our hearts and that we would become a hundred percent everything we read tonight. God, I'm thanking you for the gift and thank you for the givers tonight that have given. Touch our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, our finances to grow, to be better witnesses for you, to advance your kingdom. We'll be careful to glorify you and to praise you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was the adult Bible study from Christian Tabernacle Church. Where our fine pastor is Dr. James L. Mormon, and Sister Mormon is his only lady. So we thank God that they aren't here tonight, but continue to pray that they would get rest in their bodies, their minds, their souls, and for our entire Christian Tabernacle Church family. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. We will see you next week. We're going to have a good time. See you then. God bless you.